Tonight we want to uh, continue with our study in John's Gospel. Uh, we're going to be reading from chapter 2 tonight. And uh, the, the, the first part of chapter 2, we're going to take chapter 2 as a whole. The first part is the first miracle that Jesus ever did. As, you know, the first miracle he ever did. Because he didn't do any miracles before his time began. As a, he didn't make any wooden birds and teach them to fly. He didn't do anything like that. Traditions, you know, all the stories about Jesus as a child. And in chapter 2 we see, uh, we're going to talk about that first miracle. That In John's Gospel there are eight recorded miracles or signs. And each one of those signs, we, we, we said that John's Gospel was a Gospel that presents Jesus as God. And each one of those, those miracles has like a significance. There's other miracles recorded elsewhere, of course, in the other Gospels. But there are eight recorded here, and each one has kind of a specific purpose dealing with the, the, uh, the topic of the, of the Gospel. But also in chapter 2, we see another incident that was, it was also a sign. It wasn't a miracle, but it was a sign. And they had to do, really both of these signs had to do with Christ as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Christ is the God of Israel, and that is what he was. Uh, so beginning in chapter 2, this, this, this miracle to me always, I mean, I've read it and I understand it, and, I, and if you read different commentators, they'll give you different opinions as to the uh, implications of, of this. And I have my opinion on that, and I'll give that, of course, tonight, but I really believe that the Holy Spirit wants to show us in relating to this miracle. But I always had, I don't want to say I was, I've been perplexed, but is, this is one of those things you read in the Bible and you've got to scratch your head and say, hmm, okay? Because the miracle takes place in a surrounding that would seemingly be like no big deal. It was a wedding. Well, that was a big deal. If people get married, it was a big deal. But it's like, why did he choose this to be his first miracle recorded in the gospel. Why did the Holy Spirit include that? If you remember when we were reading in chapter 1, we were reading how Jesus began assembling his band of disciples. And we said he probably had at least six. We know there's five named, but uh, actually there's four named, but there's one unnamed, and that one is probably John who wrote this gospel. And it's very likely that John got his brother James. That's we're kind of reading that into the text. But uh, Peter and Andrew and Philip and Nathaniel, he had six of his disciples gathered together. And it says, In the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, which is a few miles north of Nazareth. And the mother of Jesus, Mary, was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. So it's pretty safe to assume that they went to this wedding reception and uh, they were invited. They, so it might have, been a, might have been a family member, could have been somebody, somebody they had known from town, but Mary and Jesus were obviously invited and the disciples were from that area, so it could be that they were all invited. And of course in the Jewish wedding, it was not like our wedding where we have like a 20 minute ceremony and then a three hour reception and then it's off, you know. Uh, they it would go for days. It would go for a few days, and it would, it would be a big deal. Just like when Rose and I were blessed to be able to go to uh, Germany for Ralph and Anne's wedding. Uh, the ceremony was a pretty lengthy ceremony. The reception was like 12 hours long. And, uh, and Ralph told us if they had drinking and dancing, it probably would have went on for about another day or two, but that's the way they do it. But uh, that's the way they did it back then. So they, they're called... They went to this wedding reception. They went to this wedding, celebrate. Well, obviously, when they got there, the, the wedding had been finished, and they were in the celebrating part. And when they wanted wine, it says in verse 3, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. Now, again, there's some different ways you could see this, this request from her. Uh, she had known, 
you know, at, at this point in time, Jesus had amassed his, these six disciples with him, and maybe a few more by, by this time, but at least six. He had been in the wilderness for 40 days. Uh, he had been baptized. It had been the testimony of Jesus Christ of who he was. So his mother, Mary, remembering when she brought the baby to be dedicated, uh, Simeon was there, and he pronounced the prophecy over Jesus. And, and uh, when Jesus was 12 years old in the temple, when they came looking for him, he says, I must be about my father's business. So Mary knew that there was something. That she knew that things were starting to happen with her son. He was 30 years old, and now... Things are beginning to happen. He's making these claims. He's receiving worship as Messiah because the disciples followed after him. They said, this is he of whom was prophesied the Messiah and so forth. So uh, he's owning this Messiahship, right? So Mary knows that, that Jesus is getting ready to be the king in her estimation. And it's almost like she's saying to him, they have no wine do something. Do something about it. Now, now I, I, I want to say this right now, and I'm going, to, I'm going to get this off the table right now, okay? I'm going to say this right up front. I don't believe Christians should drink alcohol, okay? All right? That's pretty clear, right? I don't believe, I, in the 21st century, I don't believe that Christians should drink alcohol, okay? And people will say, well, Jesus turned the water into wine, and people say, yeah, but it wasn't alcoholic wine. Well, you know, when you take grape juice and you stick it in a pig's gut for a while, you know what happens to it? It gets fermented. I mean, I don't know what people make a big deal of. It's just because I'm saying that, I'm not saying, well, it's okay to go drinking. I'm not saying that. But it was wine. That's what, they didn't have refrigeration. They didn't have Welch's. You know, they, they, didn't have, like, they didn't process it to put it in a bottle and seal it so it wouldn't ferment, right? You know what happens when I had a little... Uh, a little communion set. It was those little communion sets you get. It has some cups in it. It has a little bottle. You put grape juice in it. So you get take communion to people in the hospital in that. Okay? So I did that one time. I, I had that, and I went out, and I took communion. I forgot to, I forgot to empty the grape juice out of the, out of the little bottle that was left. I forgot about it. And I left it there for about a week, and I opened it up, and the thing had, like, exploded because it, it ruined my communion set. But anyway, so, I mean, you know, grape, it just turns into wine. All right? Okay. So I just get that off the table. All right? Because... People say it, it, it was probably it was probably alcoholic wine because it's wine is wine, right? Okay. Anyway, so all right. I just wanted to clear that up. Okay. Now, Jesus said, or Mary said, Jesus, they they, had, they don't have any wine. Like, hey, you're the Messiah. Is this a big deal for you? Right? You're going to be the king. These people are having a wedding reception. They run out of wine. So you know, do something about it. Go down the store and pick up a couple bottles. Do something about it. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with you? My hour has not yet come. Now, I don't know what tone of voice he, he had when he said this. It's almost like he's saying, and I'm just, please, this is just me, okay? So don't. It's almost like he's saying, what do you want me to do about it? <laughs> okay? I mean, that's what I'm getting from it. Like, My hour's not yet come. I'm going to be, I'm the Messiah, right? I'm worried about their wine. Okay, but listen. Here's what happened. His mother said unto the servants, whatever he says unto you, do it. So mom must have had some. <laughs> whatever he says unto you, do it. Now, this seemingly inconsequential Event, this wedding where they ran out of wine. This, this is not an earth shattering big, big deal here. But the first miracle that Jesus did, and I believe this was all ordered because he wanted, to, he wanted to show something here. The world wasn't watching. He wasn't doing this in front of 5,000 people or 10,000 people, as we're going to see later on. He has disciples with him, people at this wedding. And they didn't even know what was going on. The only ones who knew what was going on were the servants and Mary and the disciples. And also Jesus' brethren. He, he had some brothers with him too. Jesus had brothers, okay. So Mary says, do whatever he says. And there were set there six water pots of stone. 
after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece, around 15 gallons in these pots, these clay pots. And they were there because the, the, the Jews at the time of Jesus, they had created a bunch of, of laws and rules that they had to follow. And, and, and one, of the, one of the rules they had was they, they, they went through the ceremonial washing. Jesus referred to it in one of the other Gospels because uh, they, were, they were offended because he wasn't going through the, the ritual. They would have to put the water on their hands and make sure the, the drops didn't fall somewhere. I mean, it was like a big, long deal just to, just to eat. So they had these water pots, and they were used for cleansing. I believe that these really represented, and when we talk about the significance of this particular miracle, we see this represented as the emptiness of the formalistic religion of the Jews at that time. Because they had taken the law of Moses, which was good, and they had added to it and added to it and added to it the traditions of men. So by the time, and we're going to see this manifested here later on, by the time that Jesus got here, the Jews' religion was just that. It was the Jews' religion, not, not God's religion, not God's commandments. They were based on there. God's commandments were in there, but they added so much of their own stuff. And I believe these water pots, in my estimation, and you, you could read different commentators and they'll have different opinions, but I believe that this represented what happened to Judaism. It got empty. With all the formalism and all the stuff they imposed upon people, it had nothing to do with anything. But these water pots were empty. They were empty. And there was no wine. And what does wine represent in the Bible? It represents joy. Joy. The joy of the Lord. You know, don't put new wine in old wineskins, right? Right? It was, it, the presence of joy, the presence of the Spirit of God. So, Jesus said there were six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece, 15, 20 gallons. Jesus said unto them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. Water, of course, in the New Testament contents, uh, context, is the washing of the water of the word. Putting the word of God in cracked pots. That's what, that's what Paul said. We're, we're earthen vessels. Right? He said, fill them up with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine. And knew not where it came from. But the servants withdrew the water they knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good stuff, but when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good until now. See, this was a picture of what Jesus, what Christ came to do. He came to give us the joy for mourning. He came to fill up the emptiness the empty religion of Israel, the Messiah came to bring life back to his people. Of course, we know they rejected him. We're going to see that as we look on here a little bit. This was a significant sign at the very beginning. The first miracle that he did, insignificant, at somebody's wedding. We don't even know the names of the people who got married. He didn't do it for the world. Well, he did it for us to read in the gospel. But at that time, he did it. His disciples were there. He wanted them to see. That he was the God of creation. He was the God that brings life and joy. He was the God that transcends religion. It says in verse 11, This is the beginning of miracles that Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. Well, wait a minute. Fire, fire didn't come down from the sky. He hadn't been nailed to a cross yet. If, you know, if you go all the way back here, chapter 1, verse 14, where he said, the word was made flesh and he dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. He wanted to show his disciples just who he was. This was personal between him and them. The servants saw it. Maybe nobody else in that wedding really knew what happened. But the ones that it counted, he wanted to show them. 
the power that he had. It says, he manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Well, they believed who he was even before that. We read in the last chapter that they said, this is the Christ, the Messiah. But he's starting to show himself as God in the flesh, because no man could do what he did. No man could do that. This was a, this was a personal revelation. We're going to find out, and a lot of these signs kind of have a counterpart later on. His, his very last sign that he did was also a personal revelation to his disciples when he brought forth the draft, the, the draft of fishes. But that's, that comes later. Okay. So we see this first miracle. Jesus Christ, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, going to a celebration, meeting the need that they had. It's seemingly as insignificant as it seems to us at a wedding. Showing that he is the God of creation, right? Okay. Now, verse 12, it says this. After this, he went down to Capernaum. He and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. Okay, verse 13. And the Jews' Passover... Kind of like the way he put it, like it was the Jews' Passover. It's what they had made it. He said the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, which is what all Jewish men were supposed to do. And they were supposed to attend at least one of the three main holidays, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Passover, or I'm sorry, Day of Pentecost. They were, they were required to be there at least once a year if they could, and the ones that lived closer were required to be there all the time. We, don't, we know that the first time that Jesus went to Jerusalem for the Passover, when he was 12 years old, remember that story back in Luke? They went there. That was his first. He had become a man, the bar mitzvah thing. He became a man in the eyes of the, the, the people there, that, that rite of passage. He went down there, and when they were coming back, they lost him. And when they went back, where they find him? He was in the temple, teaching the teachers. It says in Luke that he was asking questions. Well, the, that the form of teaching that they were talking about, they would ask questions because they knew the answer. Jesus wasn't asking questions to get the answer. He knew all the answers. He wanted to see if they knew the answer, right? So his first time uh, going to the Passover was he ended up in the temple doing some teaching. Well, this is the next recording. And I'm sure he had been to Jerusalem before this, before he began his ministry again. We don't, we're not told of those years between 12 years old and 30. We're not told of, of those years. Nothing significant happened. But now his ministry has begun. John pronounced him as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's the, he's the Passover Lamb. He'll be the Passover Lamb that they missed. Now, the first Passover of his ministry... He went there, and he went to the temple. And what did he find in the temple? Those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sitting. Now, we've talked about this before. Again, this is what we go back to what the, what the, what the high priest and what the leadership had made their religion, Judaism. They turned it into a bazaar. Like they call it the Bazaar of Annas, who was the high priest. They were, they were selling sacrifices, because when they came to the Passover, they had to bring, an, they had to bring a sacrifice, a lamb, or uh, there, were, there were different uh, sacrifices prescribed to come. And they had to, they had to be, it had to be spotless, and it had to pass the, the, uh, the inspection of the, of the Levites, you know. And I'm sure if, if somebody just brought their own lamb, one little speck on that lamb, and they would say, nope, you can't, you have to get a pre-approved. We, we got these lambs pre-approved, guaranteed. You checked it out with God. Of course, there would be a price. And you know how it is, you know, when you go buy souvenirs, right? <laughs> it's a price. It'd be a whole lot more than what you pay somewhere else. But that's pre-approved. And they had the money changers. 
because everybody had to bring the temple tax. I believe it was two shekels or a shekel. I can't remember how much it was. But it had to be a a shekel of the temple. People would come to this celebration from different parts of the world, Jews from Greece and Jews from uh, Italy and Jews from all around the world, and they would come with the money in their pockets, and that was not acceptable. It had to be a pre-approved, it had to be a temple, a temple money. So, well, you know, if you had a shekel hanging out in your pocket and you wanted to bring it, well, we don't know where that shekel was. That could, some, some Gentile could have had that in his hand. So, well, we have these pre-approved, sanctified, blessed by the Pope, you know, I mean, holy water, right? We got these pre-approved here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Plant your seed. Now, don't you get me started. Huh? But watch out. And, of course, one shekel was probably going to cost two or three because this is pre-approved. And they were raking in money hand over fist. Just like the ones that you watch on TV. And I, the, I, I'll tell you what, in, if you, we have Dish TV, okay? And all the religion channels are like up toward the top of the, the thing, you know, the numbers. They're like, they have them all together, you know. And, and I, honest to goodness, I, 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 I was watching one night. And matter of fact, last night, I was up kind of late. And I was watching... And I was going through the channel. Every channel I hit up there, it was like, plant your seed, plant your miracle seed. I went to the next one. It was like, oh, send your, offer, send your Yom Kippur offering because it's all you require. And, and everybody, everybody is like asking for money, and they're not giving anything for Maybe a book, something, nothing. They know how to make money off of religion. Well, it's nothing new. They were doing it then. Jesus went in. And he found the temple. And those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords. Oh, see. See, in, in the previous miracle we saw his power. Now we're seeing his authority. He made a scourge of small cords and he drove them out of the temple. And the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overthrew the tables. He tore the place up. This Jesus. And you know what's really strange about this? Nobody tried to stop him. They had a temple guard. We read in other places. They they had they had uh, the, the Sadducees had a had their uh, you know secret service right. Nobody tried to stop him. Nobody, nobody came up against him. He just marched in there and he started doing his thing. And he said to them that sold us. See, that in itself is a miracle. <laughs> that's not counted as one of the miracles in John. But that's like a ninth miracle that wasn't a miracle. That Nobody tried to stop him. Nobody could stop him. He said, take these things out of here. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Now, by the way, I should say, this happened again at the end of his ministry. During the Passion Week, this is the first time. This is the only place where this is recorded here. But the other uh, recordings of this are at the end of his ministry. Okay, after after his entrance. But this is the first time. He says, take these things out. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. God help us. Man, we put a price tag on everything. And the disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. Quotation from the Old Testament prophet. So after this was all done, after this was finished, the Jews came to him. And they said, what sign do you show us? They said, what what sign... Showest thou unto us that you do these things. What? They were probably amazed. They, they probably stood back, the high priest and the soldiers. They couldn't do anything to stop them. 
They knew there was something. Just like when his disciples saw him change the water to wine, they knew that that was something special. That he had power. He, had, he was the creator. He was God in the flesh. They, and, and, and the disciples understood that. They believed that. But here are these high priests, and they said, what? So how can you do this? And they were probably asking themselves, why couldn't we stop you? Probably cost them a lot of money. They lost a lot of money in that bunch. What signs show us thou unto us, seeing that you do these things? Show us. Everybody's looking for a sign. So, you know, his disciples, it's almost like telling parables. He told his disciples the parables were, 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 were a dividing line. Because the people that really wanted to know the truth would, would find out, and the people that didn't care would just shrug them off. Well, these, these guys, they said, show us a sign. Maybe they wanted to find out how they could stop them the next time. <laughs> show us a sign. What? In, in another place, he said, where did you get the authority to do this? The second time he did it, at the end of his, of, of his life, they said, who gave you this authority? Show us a sign. And Jesus said unto them, here's a sign. The only sign he would, he would pronounce to his enemies was the testimony of his resurrection, something they, they could never deny. They didn't understand it at this point. But he said this, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And they said, 46 years this temple was in building. And you're going to build it in three days? Three days? See, they didn't understand. That temple that they were worshiping in, that was just a building made of brick and stone. It was like nothing. In fact, that building was built by Herod. Herod didn't build that building to worship God. Herod built that building to garner worship to himself. Yet it was built on the place. It was built in the place that God had ordained his temple would be. That's why when Jesus said, this is my father's house. Because it was his property. It was his territory. It is today on that temple mount. That's God's territory. He says, you've defiled my father's house. The Jews said, you're going to build this temple in three days? Who do you think you are? Well, he just went over and tore the place up and they couldn't stop him. Here's a sign. That should have been a sign of who he was. God in the flesh. Jesus said, Destroy this temple. But he spoke of the temple of his body, his resurrection. When, when they asked him in another gospel, they asked him, they said, show us a sign of who you are. They went to see him do a miracle. He says, you'll see no sign except the sign of the prophet Jonah, who was dead three days in the belly of the fish. He said, That's, there's a sign. His resurrection is a sign. His resurrection is proof of who he is. He conquered death. Death couldn't hold him. He says, when he was therefore risen from the dead, in verse 22, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Again, this is, he's saying all this. Why? So he's going to show, he's showing his disciples who he is. And they didn't even understand it at this time because they didn't really know about the cross and the resurrection. But after the resurrection, then, that just helped them believe all the more that he said this. Jesus is proclaiming. He's come to die. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. During the Passover... There would be probably thousands of people bringing lambs uh, to, to, to the slaughter to be killed and blood let out. And they didn't realize that the real Lamb of God, the one that would end, end all that, once and for all, was right in their midst. He was going to bear the sin of the world. Now it goes on and says this. We've got three more verses. and I keep looking at the clock. 
Don't look at that clock. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't want to go too long, but I don't want to be too short either. All right. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Now, John does not list the, the miracles that he did there at this time. In fact, at the end of John's gospel, he says, if he tried to explain, tell you about every miracle, it would fill all the books. But he was obviously doing miracles. He was obviously doing healings or whatever. And the people, there were people that believed in his name. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. You know, at the end of the sign of the miracle in Cana, his disciples believed on him. And his disciples stayed with him. At the end of all the miracles he did in Jerusalem, we don't know how many. People believed on him there, but you know what? Jesus didn't, he didn't get too excited. Because there's a lot of people who say, I believe in Jesus. And they might even be serious about it. When we get to chapter 6, oh, they were ready to crown him king right then and there. Until he said no. And they all left him. Everybody says, I believe in Jesus. I'm just reading today on Facebook. One of, one of the, the popular Christian bands, one that I really liked a lot, been around a long time. The lead singer said, talking about gay marriage, he says, well, I don't care what the word says. He says, we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't tell people how to live. <laughs> I like their music. They make good music. What happened to him? He said he believed in Jesus. All these people, they said, believe in Jesus in three and a half years, they're going to crucify him. They believe in Jesus. They saw the miracles. They believed. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you something. If your belief is based on, on a miracle you've seen, that's great that God will show us what he can do. He can show us his power. He showed his disciples who he was there in Cana, that he was able, he was the creator. But if, 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 if your belief is only on something you've seen, there might come a time when you ain't going to see what you want to see. Our belief has to go deeper than that. All these people, yeah, they, oh, they, they lined up. Miracles, man, heal me. I pray for healing. I pray for God to do miracles and touch people. And... But if he doesn't do it the way I want him to do it, does that mean he's not God? It says, Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew, he knew, he knew all men. You need to watch who you commit yourself to. Same thing when Paul and Silas were in Philippi. And they'd be walking through town and that demon-possessed woman would come up behind them. And say, this is, these are servants of the Most High God. I've said this before. If it was today, we'd give her a picture in the magazine. <laughs> we'd put her in charisma. You know, whoa. Paul cast the devil out of her. He didn't buy it. Not everybody and everything says, praise the Lord. Jesus knows all men. Jesus knows our heart. You say, God, God knows my heart. That's right, he does. He does, he knows our hearts. Some people use that as, a, as an excuse to just like sin. Oh, well, you know, Jesus knows my heart. Right. It's wicked above all things. That's what the Bible said. He did miracles. And people, many people believed on him. But he didn't commit himself unto them. Because he knew all men. And he needed not that any should testify of men. Because he knew what was in man. See, God knows. He knows. He knows what's in our hearts. He really does. 
You know, there are some folks who can spot a phony a mile away. <laughs> Jesus can spot a phony <laughs> a galaxy away. He knows us. And you know what I found out? Nobody's perfect. I was listening, I was listening to a message today from uh, Charles Stanley. I had the radio on in the car. And a lot of times people will, will judge our, our lives or the lives of other people by, by how well we do, how well we keep the Ten Commandments. How, you know, Charles Stanley said this. It, was, it blessed me. He said this. He says, we're all utter failures. When it comes to keeping God's law, we're all miserable failures. And until we realize that, we'll never experience the grace of God. Until we understand, it was, I mean, it was a great message. Until we understand just how incapable we are of serving God, we'll never, we'll never experience the grace of God. Because when we come to the point where we look at ourselves and say, I'm a miserable failure, that's when God says, that's right. That's the idea. That's what grace is. He'll take a miserable failure. And if you come to him and say, God, I'm a failure. See, these people coming to him and, 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 and many of the people that followed after Jesus and many of the people that follow after Jesus today, they don't want to admit their failures. They're just looking for somebody to help them out of their problem. But when we realize what failures we are, See, Jesus, it says, he didn't need that any should testify of man. He, Jesus didn't need to go buy a psychology book. Oh, he knows us. <laughs> and you know what? That doesn't scare me. That gives me peace. He knows me. I could sit here and tell you, you know, you might say, oh, you know, Pastor Carmen, he's, Jesus, he knows me <laughs> better than anybody does. He knows me better than she does. He knows her better than I do. He, he knows you. <laughs> he knows what's in us. But see, just like he had authority to cleanse that temple, he got authority to cleanse this temple, too. He'll chase out the money changers. He'll chase, he'll chase out the religious devils in there. He'll, he'll, cha he'll chase them out. He'll cleanse us if we let him. But we've got to realize that it's all him and not us. Two celebrations in this chapter. Two miracles, even though the second one really isn't counted as a miracle. The miracle of Jesus' creative power, the miracle of his authority that nobody can challenge. Nobody can stand up against Christ. If you go to later on, to like chapter 12, Jesus said, the, the, the prince of this world has nothing on me. He didn't know the devil nothing. Because he's the son of God. He's God in the flesh. He created him. He created you and he created me. And he has power of life. He has power to take these earthen vessels and fill them up with the joy and the fullness of the Holy Spirit and, and, and empower us and teach us and show us and show us the truth and have the Holy Spirit come beside us and be our paraclete, be our helper. He has the authority to use us for his glory. But Paul said in Corinthians, he says, we're just earthen vessels. That we might show forth his glory. The same glory that it talked about. Say the word became flesh and manifested his glory to us. Manifested his glory to his disciples there in Cana, Galilee. He manifested his glory to the, to the leaders in Israel too when he cleansed that temple out. He wants to manifest his glory to us when he wants to fill us with his joy, fill us with the joy of the, of the Lord, when he wants to cleanse this temple. 
his authority and his power. He wants to manifest in every one of our lives. His creative power. Create in me a clean heart. Oh, Lord, my God. Restore a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Fill this empty pot with, with the joy of the Lord. And renew a right spirit within me. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's God in the flesh who is able. God is able. Amen? Praise the Lord. Anybody have any comments or questions?